Hey everyone, thank you for checking out the second episode of the Untitled Interview Show. I'd like to give a quick thank you and a shout out to Aaron Nixon for redoing the intro and doing all the graphic design so far. I appreciate all the work they've done and I appreciate you for watching the episode. Thank you and I hope you enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to the second episode of the Untitled Interview Show. I'm your host Dylan Fewings and I'm only just slightly less disappointing than the final season of Game of Thrones. If you're wondering who this homeless looking man is talking at you, I'm a predominantly music journalist. I've written articles and shot photos and videos for Music Beyond Headlines that's based here on the coast and Masked Faces, a publication based over in the US. I used to be a video game journalist in a previous life and that's basically all led me here. My next guest is a writer and director who just recently got back from directing his second stage play, Ava Takes Up Aviation, at the Brisbane Powerhouse Theatre. He's a good friend of mine, a good friend of yours. Please welcome Thomas Svensson. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Before we get into the questions, I've been uh, doing this bit where I go up shopping and I, I get everyone uh, that comes on the show a gift. Oh! Oh. So last week I had Colossus Records on and I got them all a collection of records. Um, for you, I decided to go a little bit different and I got you uh, a book on a century of Australian cinema. Oh my god. That's so cute. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, oh my that's goodness. for you. Oh my goodness, thank you. You're welcome. I actually, actually this is incredible. Thank you. I didn't actually expect this. <laughs> no worries, I'll get you to, get you to, hold, it up to hold it up to the camera. This is very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's awesome. So, Ava Takes Up Aviation just recently finished its uh, its week run. How was mm. that? What was that like? It was an incredible experience. Like I, I feel very privileged to have done it. Um, it was very exhausting though. It was four nights of putting on the play for the powerhouse. And even though the play was two minutes, the whole process, the creative process was was like just such a learning curve, I think. Like I think I learned so much as a director on what to do next, and I'm just really proud of how, how everything like turned out. <laughs> what was the process of actually getting yourself involved? I applied for it. So yeah, short and sweet, the festival itself had applications, so anyone could apply to do like either, have, their pl have a play that they can direct at the Gold Coast or Brisbane. And I really wanted to go for the Brisbane one, so when I applied, I made sure that um, I made sure that it was like sort of my, my specification to do it, and like something I really wanted to do. And once I applied, a few weeks later, they just came out and offered me to do the second strand. And what drew you to the event? Always wanted to work in like Brisbane. Like I always had a desire to work in Brisbane because I did a lot of coast work on the coast, and I didn't find like sort of like any creative opportunities here and I was always driven to work in Brisbane so when Sean and Sweet arrived it's like just it's a 10 minute play you can just do whatever you want with it they give you like a lot of creative liberties with the piece the one that you're given and I really just went for it because working in, in Brisbane was just something I had in mind just directing wise I really wanted to direct and kind of see what it's like like see what the crowd's like, see what are the actors like, like what's the, what, what is it like? So yeah, I really wanted to aim for that. Now, because we've obviously been friends for quite some time, and how long has it been now? Like, like five, six years? Like a day. Like a day? <laughs> I, this guy just rocked up <laughs> oh, earlier on today, I, I haven't been able to get rid of him yet. If, if you know someone who can help, please call me. Um, <laughs> But I, Since high school. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this interview in, 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 so in a way that feels like I, I know nothing about you at all. So tell me, is, is directing your, your main focus, your first focus? I like to see myself as someone who can do anything. Like I don't want to be sort of classified as like one thing. This year and like last year, I've been doing like a lot of writing and directing and I kind of see myself as somebody who works mainly in, with writing and directing film or theatre at the moment, um, whether that means like I change in the future or something new pops up, 
I'm not really too sure yet, but I've always just seen myself as like, sort of like, just like an artist, yeah, at the moment. Let's wind it back a little bit. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? Where were you born? Grew up in Brisbane. Always forget where I was born. Born in Brisbane. Like, somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. I grew up in a place called Forest Lake. Yeah, it's just, um, it's pretty like, when it comes to, it's not, it's nowhere near the city. So it was a completely like different life to living on the coast eventually. Um, yeah, I grew up there and I moved to the coast in about, when I was like in grade six, I think. What was that move like coming from, I guess, sort of a more metropolitan area to considerably more rural? Yeah, than, it's definitely than, more rural. Yeah. Yeah, we had like acreage, no neighbours, it was, like I kind of yearn, I think that's what drove me to want to work in Brisbane so much, it's like I kind of yearn to work where I came from, and I think like, I do prefer people everywhere, like something happening, like I prefer like going out and like seeing if there's like something open at like 3am, like, with, with like a bunch of friends, like here it's like, if you're not going out, like, if you're going out, like go out like, before eight o'clock <laughs> and then come home before eight o'clock because like if you're not then like there's not much really to do so I kind of love that. There's only one thing to do past eight on the coast. Hell. I hate the helm. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone hates the helm. I hate the helm. The only people that don't hate the helm are the people that are banned from everywhere else. It's the only place they can actually get in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck. Um, when did acting first pop up? When was that something you started becoming interesting in or started noticing? I think it was in high school definitely, like when I was in grade 11. Before that, I didn't really have like any ambitions or anything like I didn't, I knew I was like creative and flamboyant and I knew I had like some sort of like desire to like create and produce stuff. But like, I think it was like grade 11 where in high school, I just, I did the drama course and like, kind of got into acting as like a sort of like a startup. Uh, I didn't even know why I ended up even choosing it. I just kind of was drawn to it and that's kind of like what kicked it off for me, yeah. Were there any, uh, any, any movies or specific performances from actors that gave you the inspiration as, as, as well as actually just sort of jumping into it? Was there anything that made you go, oh fuck, that's what I want to do? I think like, when I think of like actors that drove me towards creating like really good like theatre or film like or really inspired like my beginnings to that sort of a medium I always think of like Marlon Brando <laughs> ever since like we saw a clip of him like in A Streetcar Named Desire and I'm just I was just fascinated by Marlon Brando just like what he was able to do so like the way he projected himself and his voice and like the way he carried himself as an artist, I just was just so fascinated and like still one of my like biggest influences when it comes to sort of like just life in general. Ava Takes Up Aviation is your second directorial uh, performance, correct? Yeah, it's the second one I've like directed. Which before. was your first? So The Forgotten Bird was a play that I had written over the course of a year and that was with more people I've met at uni who like kind of took it on board and they needed a director, so I, I just jumped in and did it because I really wanted to do something that I had written. And this new, it kind of like led me to the new opportunity. So I didn't write Ava Takes Aviation. It was a Chicago writer called John Weigley, and that was just submitted through the festival. Yeah. So it was, it was a completely different experience taking somebody else's words and then seeing what, like, pathway or what you can do with the sort of like the language that was crafted in the work. Yeah, it was just completely different. Are you in direct contact with the writer, or is it just you get given it and, and get told to go nuts? Oh, you can, so like, it depends on who kind of does it. Like, most people, most sane people <laughs> will contact the writer, so I, like, we have brief contact. Like, we didn't, we didn't have a call, we just, like, sent a few emails. I was pretty much just letting them know that I was doing it. So yeah, we did end up taking a little few, like, small liberties when it came to, like, oh, this kind of sounds American. We kind of need to make it sound Australian for like a different audience. So those were taken in consideration to still being true to kind of the story John was trying to tell. So it was never of like, we never tried to kind of overlay 
the story with like a, something completely different. It was more of a how can we like transition this in an honest way. Yeah. Try to keep it faithful but still yeah. try to adapt it for the, the different audience. Yeah, a different audience. Yeah, because he's a Chicago writer and it's in, in Brisbane so like some things aren't... Some things definitely aren't going to translate yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, words are escaping me today. Which, right. which is bad considering that's my fucking job. <laughs> I, we get, I've got all afternoon with you. What's the difference going into a project solely as as the, the director and then as the, the writer-director comparing to The Forgotten Bird? Well, when you're writing something, like, I, when I write, I imagine it. So, like, I can... I already understand exactly what the stage directions are going to be because I've imagined it in my head and I've seen it and I've kind of, like, dreamt about it. For like over the course of like a few months. Do you visualize the the entire thing at once or, or certain sequences? Sequences, yeah. So if I'm writing a new play, sometimes it comes to me in different sequences. Like I'll figure out the ending, and then I'll figure out so sort of like the way the characters have like evolved during the middle, and like the beginning is usually something I like I can figure out last. But it, it changes all the time. But the ending is like super super important for me in the creative process. To like go okay. All of these things have to make sense to lead up to here. Otherwise, like it can't, everything kind of gets lost. Yeah. You, you don't want to pull an M.R. Shyamalan. <laughs> no. No, no, no. Yeah, it kind of has to have a plan. But when I'm writing, it kind of it's hard because like you kind of have to structure it after the creative process. So like structuring it like during and like kind of like producing the work during writing is kind of like putting a cloud over your like artistic vision. You kind of do that. Like for me personally, I kind of do that at the very end of writing, yeah. What's it like directing someone else's material as opposed to your own? It's completely, I guess it depends on like which way you look at it. For me, I felt like I'd already written it just because I, like, I felt like I could resonate with it emotionally. So going into it, it's the, it's the same respect to that writer. It's the same as if like it was my sort of like baby, you know what I mean? Like it's that same, like the same respect applies. It's just different though when you're trying to f figure out the specific language to this writer and you kind of have to like empathize, empathize with like their work. So it's completely different in the way in which you interpret the way they like represent their characters, their language in the work and you kind of have to transfer that with your interpretation. So there's definitely like a, there's more empathy is kind of needed, if that makes sense. Like with the, okay, this comes from somebody else, you need to really respect that. And when you've written something like that's yours, there's an instant like, oh, I, I own it because like I've written it. But yeah, with somebody else's, you kind of have to be like way more respectful and kind of like more aware really, yeah. When did the writing process for The Forgotten Bird start? Oh. That was like, I think the first year of uni, I was really, really frustrated with like not feeling like I was getting anywhere. And so I had written scenes for like a screenplay class. And I, I think I think I took that one. Yeah, yeah, I've written scenes for that class. And like the scene that I'd chosen just didn't fit in with like what I was trying to tell in like the seven pages you were allowed to write. So I kind of took that scene and then I eventually like elaborated it way more and did like way more with it than I probably like would have been at uni. And yeah, so that took like about a year to write. And yeah, ever since, <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other older inspirations that you, you want to bring up? I love, there's, there's just so many. Like I, I love, um, Depends on like what we talk about. Like if we're talking about like American theater, I love you know Tennessee Williams. I also love Vladimir Mayakovsky. His work was like incredible when it came to like the futurist movement in theater. And yeah, so like I've got there's like so many classical sort of writers, playwrights, and like icons from the past who have definitely like influenced my work. But there's just so many like modern artists as well. Like today. Like, I love, like, musicians like Tyler Creator and Frank Ocean, like, they're, like, they keep me, like, sort of remembering to, like, always keep my work modern, you know, like, because I can always, like, sometimes slip back into 
creating something that probably isn't modern. Yeah, I've just got to be always like aware of that. If my research is correct, at some point during your high school experience, you got uh, dance battles at the school band. Could you could you tell me about what happened there? I I vaguely like even remember the <laughs> the experience. I just want I just I just wanted to ask you. Yeah, 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 yeah. How funny that story is. Like, so I was crazy in high school. He yeah. I don't know. Just I think I just had so much like, I just felt like I didn't express myself in primary school so like high school came and I was like not just expressing myself it was just like really expressing myself like it was really like you weren't even just expressing there. yourself you were just expressing expressing like anything and like I can't even remember like I remember dance battles like just going out to people and then like doing like a dance battle because I remember it was like handball and then but I wanted my own thing so like dance battles came around and like came to a point like somebody had I think they messaged me or like I heard from a friend that there was this like one kid who was like a bit younger than me and he wanted to dance battle me during lunch break so like yeah obviously like I'm the dance battle guy it's so, like yes <laughs> let's do it at that point I was the crazy dance battle guy so like obviously yes and we I met up with him and like we we're like well in round one and then we that was a good round it was fine like I'm pretty sure we're like on the same like he did a few cool moves I did a few cool, cool. It's still, still pretty neck and neck. Yeah, yeah, it was like neck, neck and neck. Like, I swear I was like mid dancing and like some of the people who ran like the office, like head office, like came and like pat me on the back or like they, they made some like scene about like some like some, some sort of like commotion like, oh, you gotta like come like with us and like stop this and like come with us. Like they did like come with us like gag. And like a few people stopped and like it was a bit awkward. And then, um, so yeah, I, ended up just walking with them after like a, a really awkward silence. I walked with them to like to the front of the school and then they just let me go. Like there was no office talk. There was no like reflection or anything like that. They just like walked me and then like then let me go. And it wasn't like until like maybe a few days later they contacted me again and they were like, oh, did you know the kid that you were dance battling? Like he had a few like mental issues. Like he was like, and I was like, what does that matter? Uh, so that's why they stopped it. Like they didn't stop it because it was a dance battle. They thought I was making fun of him. When it was like a completely different situation. Like I was like, like anyone can dance battle me. I'm the crazy kid. Like I don't care. Like He wanted to so, dance, you yeah. were on board. Yeah. School wasn't. Yeah, school, school thought. School thought you were bullying. That I was bullying him by saying yes, but it was just a complete like misunderstanding. You were like, no, fuck yeah, let's do it. Let's dance. Yeah, yeah. like I don't. I honestly didn't know. Like I didn't like, and it was like yeah, exactly. I had no idea. And how 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 yeah. would you have known? Yeah, and you I was like, what's to, the point? You just wanted to dance. Yeah, <laughs> just wanted to dance. I literally didn't even understand the point. But like, I don't even think that was the last dance battle. There's many more. There's many more after that. What else did we get banned from Chancellor? We got we we banned um, uh, dance battles. Dance battles. Arm wrestling. Oh my god. <laughs> was Pepper ever banned, or was Pepper just like? Kind of, because like we can't bring up Pepe the Frog anymore as a race, as, uh, as an alt-right symbol now. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry Pepe. Sorry. I can't remember if that actually was like something teachers hated seeing eventually. I, I don't know. I think, I, I think basically, T Thomas stuck pictures of Pepe the Frog, a very classic meme, all around our high school campus. <laughs> different pictures in different places, and I think people started to realize as we were getting close to graduating. So I think it was just a problem for the year afterwards yeah, yeah. to deal with. So maybe Pepe's banned, Chancellor. And I know that one time, my friend Aaron and I, in our drama class, would play the Wii mu music song, like the Wii theme. We played that... <laughs> <laughs> we'll play that... <laughs> we would play it before every class. So like, we'll sneak in early. Or I'll sneak in early. And like, I'll put it in the amp, in the mic. Oh, you put it for the PA. Yeah, and we'll, we'll really boost that, like, we'll boost the song. <laughs> And like literally, it drove one of the other drama students like so mad that the teacher like actually banned that song like playing before the like the class. So like it drove one of the other drama students like so like infuriated them so much that like convinced the teacher to make us ban the songs. What's your plan for the future? Well, I got an opportunity to direct a play reading from the festival which I'm really, really excited about. I can't really talk too much about it at the moment, but that's another directing opportunity. So I kind of want to go and just see where that 
lead to me, but I do definitely want to write and direct something for a festival coming up at the end of the year. I definitely want to do and pursue that. Like, definitely want to try and write and direct something again and see if I can like improve on things that I uh, could have improved on for Forgotten Bird. Do you want to just focus on stage or do you want to f push to different forms of media? It is kind of like, it's, it's a special thing for me because it's like my, so like, it's like my safe place. It's like, it's the one creative outlet that I've had ever since like, like my struggles at, in high school. And it's like, it's something that's really, really personal, I think. But I definitely do want to branch out and write and direct like a feature one day. But right now, I, I kind of want to work on shorter film projects, like on the side of directing big things for theatre. Yeah. Can you see yourself having a play that you have either written or directed somewhere like Broadway? That would be cool. Yeah. That, that would be is, really is cool. Is that long term goal for you? It would be a dream come true. For sure. It'd like, it would be a big privilege, I think. But it's just working to get to that place. Yeah. And when trying again and again and again and, and really developing the the craft and really making sure that I know what I'm doing at that point. <laughs> I definitely know what I'm doing. <laughs> what other passions do you have besides theatre? Definitely theatre and film are my biggest like motivations to keep like driving through this thing we call life. <laughs> I'm not really sure what else I'm passionate about like at this point, like I definitely feel like my whole life is almost devoted to finding new stories or like watching a, a new film. I really, I really don't know an answer for that right now. <laughs> Sorry. What's, what, focusing on stories, what's a story that you want to tell? More than anything in the world. I would really love to create an honest piece about sort of all my pieces and everything that I write has always linked to like family, like our family roles, like the way a son is a son, the way a mother is a mother. And I would really love to explore that and see how I could use my, like, my personal like upbringings to sort of like resonate and connect to like an Australian drama. I would really love to see and dive into that. However, I think like it's a bit too early for me to sort of reflect onto how family has really impacted my life now so it's something like i've always i'm kind of holding on to and i really want to write in the future what about uh, genre pieces can we expect you to do any science fiction pieces soon or i like drama and comedy at the moment drama and comedy are sort of like my like if i'm not writing a drama it's it's a comedy and usually there's some bit of both i really like ugly characters though like i love ugliness Find the beauty and ugliness. Like I love sort of dysfunctional characters, so that's sort of going to be like a reoccurring theme, I think, in my work. Where do you draw your comedy influence from? I love, like, definitely it's always sunny. I love like it's comedy. always sunny in Philadelphia, Philadelphia. For those that aren't familiar. Danny DeVito is my god. <laughs> I love things that are funny because they shouldn't be funny. But, like, honestly, like... Like anti-humor, black humor. Yeah, like Andy Kaufman. You can see, like, his influence in, like, Eric Andre at the moment. Like, Eric Andre is kind of like our contemporary Andy Kaufman. So it's sort of like the comedy that's making fun of the way comedy is designed conventionally, like, to work. So I love to play sort of, like, with that as, as much as I can. But I definitely think my, like, strong... I'm much stronger in the drama. Like, more seriousness. But yeah, I do like elements of comedy. Is is the direction that society is going in the modern day something that you need to be aware of going into theatre, or is theatre constantly evolving and expanding and adjusting to the time as it goes on? Yeah, I think they are evolving. I think artists evolve with the times, and I think it's really significant to be like politically engaged or to have somewhat an understanding what's happening around you as a writer and a director, like it's really important to understand why humanity is acting the way it is, like why maybe like young people are angry right now, or maybe like why old people aren't, 
or maybe old people are angry or like you know it's it's really important to find like the groups of people and to kind of identify like why they're feeling a specific way because that always influences your decisions as a writer like it always impacts you is theatre a safe space for members of the LGBTQ community to engage and to be a part of? I mean, I think it's progressing. I think all forms of art are progressing and becoming more open for people. Like, does it, it doesn't matter who you are. And I think, like, art has always sort of been that, like that. Yeah. But it's the, like, representation of art, like, where we can find the art. Like, is it... Like, even now, it's still really hard for women directors to have their films more, like, out there to the public and more, like, being no known to, like, be watched, you know what I mean? Because we, we know so many, like, great, classic male directors. So, I think, like, the art hasn't changed. It's just the accessibility has, and it's progressing, and I think it, it definitely, I think theatre has always sort of been... A great place for anyone. I think there's sort of like an uproar at the moment, a demand for unique stories. Like the audience is getting tired of watching the same thing and even though film arguably is the same thing again repeating itself as a medium, like you're watching sort of like the similar stories. We don't want to unfold. watch continually endless sequelizations of properties yeah. from 30 years ago, we want to see something fresh. Yeah, I think the audience is like demanding that. I, I'm 100% on mm. board with that. I found myself watching uh, Avengers Endgame the day it came out and just sitting there in the theatre going, this doesn't need to be three hours long. This doesn't need to exist. I haven't seen like any Marvel movie. <laughs> I'm not going to be honest. I, I'm just totally, I'm totally out. I'm, I, I'm tapped out. I've thrown in the towel now, except for my boy Tom Holland as Spider-Man because I... I relate to Spider-Man, so... I haven't seen... I don't know, I just... I like independent films, I like... Like, my favourite film of... Like, recent is Tangerine by... Directed by Sean Baker, is filmed on an iPhone. And that film... That story alone is... Incredible. Like, the way they've... Represented the raw emotions of these two transgender women. Like, struggling in a society. Is there anything else that you want to get out there to the public, let people know? Well, <laughs> I'm not really sure. I guess like, like we've been talking about, the main thing that like, this whole interview, and like what we've been talking about, has been really important, is like the diversity that's now coming to th theatre, and I, I think it really has come to a point where it doesn't really like matter who I am, who you are, who anyone is like if the art and if like the script and if the piece is saying something like truthful i think people will tend to like more more likely like go towards it and like yearn for it yeah and i think that's like what the main thing is that we've been talking about yeah i think it's really incredible when can we expect to hear details on the next project it's really soon it's in early july so i can't really talk about I can't really like officially announce anything. It's like kind of like a smaller thing than the festival. You and Colossus Records, they couldn't they couldn't announce anything that they were releasing really? either. Why come on the show then, Tom? <laughs> Why are you here? What the fuck are you wasting my time for? I've been, I've been here like for four weeks, just showing. Oh, right. Yeah, you've just noticed me now. Yeah. I'm just here now, but I, I've been trying to say hi. Hey, like on this couch with you for like four weeks. And, oh. And you've just ignored me. Like I, I, I've been paying the dog. I've been feeding the dog for four weeks. Yeah, I've been really strung out of crack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been trying to mentor you and everything. You've just known to me. That's all the time we have for this week, everyone. I'd like to thank my guest Tom for coming out Thanks and having, having a chat with me. Keep an eye out for his next project. Directing, writing, can't say. Oh, it's a directing one. But writing one hopefully at the end of the year. Two new projects coming out, one hopefully very soon, one at the end of the year. Go check out Thomas, support him, he's a wonderful friend, and I really appreciate you coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you have any recommendations of people you'd like to see on the couch next time, be sure to leave a comment or whatever. Do what you feel like. Until next time, have a good day.